Hi, good evening to everyone. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan. Um, I've been talking about COVID and the pandemic since early 2020. My view is very simple. I recognize that this was a viral mediated autoimmune disease. Now, some people still don't quite get what that means. All I'm saying is that in a cohort of the population, the cytokine storm that kills patients is primarily a lung vasculitis triggered by specific proteins interacting with the immune system. We can argue about which proteins these are, but the cytokine storm and the autoimmunity is very clear to see. So because of that understanding, I am looking at everything around the pandemic through different eyes. And this has been a bruising week to deal with scientific censorship because these kinds of questions are critical, but inconvenient. And it's no surprise that many people are going after trying to stop these questions. And this is essentially what we had. I had the pleasure of speaking on Saturday with this group, um, two mothers, uh, Dr. Ed uh, Balbona, who had arranged to have the autopsies done and the histology. And in effect, the fact that we were talking about the potential of injury did not seem as though it went down very well. And so straight away, that video was censored. And then another video I had talking about the pathology was censored. And it's like, what is going on here? We're talking about histology. We're talking about understanding characteristics of the disease. And just so people understand, and so that you don't get fooled by people who are trying to divert your attention, when it comes to understanding a disease, there is nothing that can beat autopsy with histological analysis. The reality is that because of that, it seems that some people don't want that kind of information to become available. So if you want to see the video that was censored, please take a look. Make your judgment for yourself. The link is in the description below. You can look and see whether or not discussing the histology should be relevant. Now, additionally, what I thought I'd focus on is a clip from the presentation because you have to realize that when uh, Hetty reached out to Dr. Balbona to try and get answers for her son who died and the fact that there was an autopsy but they didn't do histological analysis so they couldn't define the reason or the cause of death. When she reached out to him, he was surprised by the fact that it was such a struggle to get this data analyzed. I'll let you listen to what he said, and then I'll come back to share what I'm going to say. Would the pathologists, separate from the, the coroner, why did pathologists not want to do the histology? Who would have thought in American medicine that we'd have such a culture of fear and intimidation and coercion? Uh, I mean, the attacks on physicians who are only trying to help their, their patients, I, I think are just obscene and unethical and the attackers need to be put into the light of day and say, what's your agenda here? You know, the, these physicians are going out of the way to help people and what are you doing? I mean, we just accept the, uh, the slogans and the coercion and the intimidation and the othering of people who have been injured and I, I find it just very um, unethical that, that for Duke University not to help someone because they're unvaccinated is unethical. To separate people by vaccine status, to not do investigations because we don't want to find the answers, that's not, um, that's not defendable, that's not correct, that's not moral. And at some point we need to take back the uh, profession of medicine and say, listen, doctors need to be free to be physicians who care first and foremost for their patients. 
and not employees of big corporations that have their own agendas and you know can be intimidated and coerced and destroyed so that's important because this is what we're up against who would have thought that in a time where we have increased disease hospitals are overburdened we're having increased excess deaths across the world at a time where excess deaths should be much lower than anticipated who would have thought that in a time like this there would be an issue with doing autopsy and trying to find an analysis to understand what is going on it's very sad but it is very very serious because a lot of people think this is just about criticizing whoever no if you are patient facing if you are seeing the patients who are sick for which we don't have clear understanding as to why and we're seeing a different pattern of disease yes they can be ignored but that could be your loved one that could be your mother that could be your father is that how you want medicine to approach what's ahead of us well what I'll do in, in order to help people to understand what it is that we're facing, I have to take you back a little bit in terms of history. And this is a recent history. So I've got here a paper. I've presented this before, but I thought this was a good time to remind people. This is about narcolepsy in Finland. And this was when they did a paper here, and this was in 2012 looking at the association with an abrupt increase in the in incidence of childhood narcolepsy in, in Finland after they started to do the H1N1 vaccination. This was unanticipated, but it's one of those things that could have been very easily ignored. But without a determination from the scientific community, a lot of children would have been just left with no answers and parents would be struggling with children narcolepsies where they f daytime sleepiness and sometimes they literally just fall asleep suddenly call that cataplexy now this is quite significant and has a tremendous impact on children and it was an outcome from the immune mechanisms around the vaccine at that point so this is recent history. This is not just something that doesn't happen. This occurs. This is how it works. So here we have this paper, and this is from 2012. And just to, to summarize essentially what they were finding. So when they looked at the average cohort, 75% of the cases were vaccinated. And of that 67 cases diagnosed, 46 were vaccinated and seven were unvaccinated. And so what they were finding here, that there was about a 12.7 um, um, increase in, um, in the rate of narcolepsy between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated um, cohort. And this was important because it helped them to notice what was happening and to be able to make some determination as how to manage these children. But here is how it works in real time. And you have to remember at that time, there probably wasn't all this censorship. This was when doctors and scientists were genuinely trying to find answers. They weren't afraid. But where we have a situation where there is fear, imagine what will happen in the context of disease. So this is here how it worked in, an, in a situation where they were looking for answers. This is the point where they call the recall of either the parent or the patient for the first symptoms. In the green here is when the vaccination occurred. And this is the baseline as to narcolepsy that was occurring. And you can see here, these are the cases. So it does occur in the baseline. But then they suddenly noticed that after the vaccination program, you started to see this occurring. And so they have at the bottom here the number of weeks beyond that. And you can see how many weeks that people started to know. So all the way up to about 30 weeks after was the first recall of the symptoms. So just as just recall. First contact, you can see, is then spread further out. And so this is 2009, this is 2010. So the first contact with a doctor 
is all the way out to about four to six weeks in some cases. When you look at referral, that's from the time the doctor sees it and says, you know, this is something to be concerned about. And you can then see that the referral here is going all the way out for a significant percentage, up to 36 to 46 weeks. When it comes to a diagnosis, you are talking well beyond the 30-week mark just to make a diagnosis in the context of where you are actually looking. Now, just think about that, because as I said, I'm focused on autoimmunity. I, I, it's not even a question in my mind that it's going to occur. I just don't know how much and how severe we're going to see a surge in autoimmunity. This has already been demonstrated. It can occur by infection, and it can occur in relation to vaccination. What the combination is going to be is absolutely frightening. And so this is why, in order to try and get answers, we need to be looking critically at the situation to try and understand exactly what is going on. Sadly, we are at a time where you are not allowed to consider the elephant in the room. Now, just remember this. If you are not allowed to consider it, it means there is no opportunity for acknowledgement. Think of this in relation to narcolepsy. Just imagine that the physicians and the scientists at that time were unable to acknowledge it. So this is how it would look. I take you back to the image here. And so this is, let's get back to this image. So just imagine that from this point, the patients and the parents notice it. Or if there's another condition, they notice it at this point. If the first contact is significantly delayed because the scientific community or the physicians don't accept or not looking or don't know where to look, and this is pushed out even further, that means that the referral could take years before it's and a diagnosis. Goodness, we could be talking about five years down the line. This is pretty serious. And this is why I'm saying is that it, it's, I, I, how do I say this nicely? When it comes to safety, safety has to be demonstrated, not assumed. You cannot assume safety. You have to prove safety. And if you have not done autopsies in sufficient numbers, especially when the autopsies that are being discussed are being censored, you cannot state that you have proved safety because that's just how science works. We are at a time where it is difficult. It is very tiring to continually be looking over your shoulder. And I'll, I'll tell you this much. You must recognize when people, even in this circumstance, when there are people who are still not interested, not even not interested, but blocking the scientific questions, trying to overcome any kind of arguments, you really have to question what their motives are. Because a true scientist, a true patient advocate, even if they don't believe it, will actually say, okay, okay, let's get back to the basics, let's prove it. Anyone who is not doing that, you know that their interest is not the patient. I don't know what their interest is. I don't know why they would do that. There are many different reasons for different people. But I can tell you, they're oftentimes not patient-facing, and they're not actually concerned about disease in the population. We're at difficult times, and it's a time to call out those people who refuse and are blocking the science. We have a long way ahead of us. Just remember how far it is when we are searching to find a diagnosis. It easily takes six months to a year. When you can't acknowledge, this could take many, many years. Many lives will be affected if there is harm. And the question still remains, who is responsible? Sadly, the doctors will still have to see the patients and try and figure them out. Have a great evening. Thank you very much.